Okay. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, good, well, good afternoon to everyone in the Eastern Time Zone. Good morning to the rest of the country and every and everywhere you're calling in from. Welcome to the Carbon Solutions webinar series, where we highlight work we are doing with our company and with our partners. My name is Richard Middleton. I am the CEO of Carbon Solutions, and I'm absolutely delighted to have each and everybody uh, here joining us today. Today, Aaron Middleton will be presenting work our team recently completed with the Great Plains Institute, Franklin Associates and SWCA, SWCA about community engagement and uh, carbon management. This presentation is an overview of a technical report that we are releasing later this afternoon. We will provide everyone a link to this report, uh, as well as the slides for all attendees after this meeting, and there will be a recording of this meeting. Please note, on that note that we are recording right now and you will be able to uh, view this presentation later along with previously recorded webinars on our YouTube channel. We would like this to be more than a one-way conversation. We encourage you to share your thoughts, questions and experiences in the chat. We have about 40 minutes and so we'll have plenty of time for questions. So we have that dedicated time for Q&A, but feel free to drop your questions in the chat throughout the session. So thank you again for being here. I will pass this over now to Aaron and to Matt Fry from GPI. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming this afternoon. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about advancing community-driven deployment of carbon management technologies, especially focusing on some roundtable discussions that happened in Louisiana. Um, we're going to start with brief introductions. My name is Erin Middleton. I'm the Director of Energy Equity at Carbon Solutions. Um, we uh, try at Carbon Solutions to integrate qualitative data from communities into some of the models that we do and uh, these kinds of community roundtables are very well aligned with getting information that local folks thinks are important in order to make our um, modeling of carbon management better. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Matt Fry, who will tell you a little bit about himself and provide a little bit of background of um, why these roundtables took place. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me. Uh, as, as Aaron mentioned, my name is Matt Fry. I'm a senior policy manager at the Great Plains Institute. Uh, I worked on court carbon management uh, policy and projects for, for quite some time. Uh, we developed or we decided to develop this uh, uh, decision support tool just based on some historical experiences we've had with with project siting, actual on the ground project siting. Uh, the the existing tools, the the decision support tools that are available from the federal entities that look at environmental justice issues do a great job of considering just social uh, values and social factors. But if any of you have ever cited a project, you realize that it's much more complex than that. So we decided that we would try to build a more all encompassing tool that looked at both social, environmental, and legal factors associated with project siting. Additionally, we wanted to go a step beyond and incorporate public input to make our decision support tool better. So that's what we have worked with this, uh, the Carbon Solutions team on, then many other things to be honest, but for this project specifically, they're going to describe our, uh, our roundtable events that we use for that public input and provide us some uh, feedback on how we did and maybe some opportunities to do things better. So once again, thanks for the invitation and I'll turn it back to Aaron. Thanks, Matt. Um, so what we're going to cover a little bit today, as Matt mentioned, is this was a team effort. Um, we'll explain a little more about what parts everybody took here, but I want to take a minute to acknowledge some of the folks from SWCA, Franklin Associates, Carbon Solutions, and Great Plains Institute. Everybody contributed to this work. Um, even though I'm presenting today, it's really a effort of lots of different folks. I want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about what I will be presenting today. One of them is why Louisiana. Um, one of them is why engagement right now. A little overview of how we conducted these roundtables, some key takeaways from Louisiana, and our relevance to other work. And many of the things that we're talking about today, we're kind of doing two things. Number one is for a very specific place, how can we make a tool that was better to represent what a Louisianians want? The next part, however, is if we're, you were to replicate this in another state, what are some things that we learned that you may take away from either 
either a citing tool or from roundtable events that would be helpful to incorporate in other work. So our goal today is to, to cover both of these things. For a little bit about why Louisiana, there's lots of different reasons. This is covered in the, the tool itself. There's some descriptions about why Louisiana and then some I wanted to go over some a little bit here too. One of them is uh, the geological storage potential in places in this map that you see in the upper left um, is work that is partly done by um, Jonathan Oglin Hand um, at Carbon Solutions. And the dark red places there are areas with great storage potential. Even if you don't see the rest of the colors, think red is great storage potential. One of the things you see around Louisiana is it is a lot of great storage potential over the entire state. Another thing that you need for carbon management, especially if we're talking about um, carbon storage, is emissions. We need to take the emissions, transport them, and store them in a location. Um, emission potential here over the United States, you're also seeing an overlap of where there is great storage potential and where there's a lot of existing emissions. Another thing that's happening across the United States are class six well applications. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of carbon management technical details, but for those who may not know, class six well applications are the way that are a special well from the Environmental Protection Agency that are uh, required for storing CO2. What you can see in these darker areas are the parishes by the number of class six well applications that have been submitted. These aren't happening yet, but somebody is starting to submit this information in in order to, to get uh, geological storage started. In addition to all of these things, there's some political climates that mean that Louisiana is very well positioned for this to happen soon. In the lower left-hand side, which may be a little bit difficult to read, is what states are, are applying for class six primacy. And what this means is, in the normal, in most states in the United States, apart from North Dakota and Wyoming, if you want to put in a class six well, you put in an application, which itself is difficult, but you put in an application, and then you're put into a queue of all of the rest of the class six well applications in the United States, with the exception of North Dakota and Wyoming. Some states are wanting to get primacy. This means they have to meet or exceed the standards that the EPA has for allowing class six wells. But instead of having the entire United States as your list, you would have those within your own state. One of the things that Louisiana has done is solicited information from the um, public as to how to have primacy for class six wells. And there's some legislative support and other support in the state for doing this. So this means not only do they have storage potential and emissions and class six well applications, but there's also um, the appetite to try to approve class six wells within their own state. In addition, Louisiana, not all states have a climate action plan, but Louisiana has led the way in climate action plans and has mentioned uh, the carbon management as an important part of um, their state's future. One of the issues that I'm sure many folks know in Louisiana is anything that is going to do with a sea level rise is going to impact many areas of the state. This was something that came up in many of the communities that we were in, not necessarily carbon management, management as a way to mitigate specifically um, flooding, but that this is a reality that many folks in the state are, are thinking of. And it's one of the reasons why Louisiana is a leader in, um, in carbon management and other, uh, other climate action uh, efforts. In addition to all of these things, and perhaps because of all of these things, things are happening in Louisiana. There's some beginning opposition. There's um, been bills and groups that have said, please don't put this here. Other people are saying, please put this here. And one of the things that um, GPI wanted to do was have a a place to actually speak to folks about what they're thinking, how citing tools can help. Um, and Louisiana is a great place to look at this for all of these reasons that are outlined here. So GPI, you can read more about these here. The, the uh, slides will be linked later and you can also Google Louisiana Decision Support Tool. I'll go over this briefly because this can be an entire presentation on its own. But because this was one of the things that we went over with the round table, I wanted to discuss this a little bit. GPI, Carbon Action Alliance and SWCA created a geospatial tool to understand carbon management. In addition to the tool, they also have some really helpful information about what carbon management is. So that if you're new to the space, it provides some information as well as uh, information about siting. Um, and 
this is kind of what the tool looks like when you have several of the layers together. You, because this is so interactive, this is just kind of one shot of what this looks like. But part of the reason to look for engagement for, as Matt mentioned earlier, is there are environmental justice concerns and many citing tools do not take this into account. This is especially true in Louisiana, um, not, in not only in terms of historical legacy of pollution, but also in terms of uh, the, the folks that are living there and some of the health concerns that have happened, which also came up in many of our roundtables. So how can we cite things with knowing that there are certain places that have had more burdens than other places in the United States. In addition, there are environmental factors such as uh, protecting coastlines, protecting uh, endangered species. How can we combine all of those things in in order to have a map to make us be better able to look at siting? So what happened for these roundtables, which again, I'll talk about in just a second, is we had a tool. And one of the things that GPI wanted to do in developing this tool was not to just have a tool, but to be able to have feedback in order to make this tool better and to get feedback in terms of was this useful? Um, how would you use this? Could you use this for other projects? What do you know about carbon management in order to make this more reflective and more useful to the local community? What happened practically was that there are four meeting locations that you can see outlined here. Um, and these are the dates and the times that these took place. Um, these were four hour meetings or so over the course of an afternoon where community meetings, community members were invited. We can talk a little bit more about the compensation structures. People who came were um, compensated for their time. There were some food that was served there so that if anybody needed any refreshment as they were looking at these tools, they would have this. This is really important to make people comfortable if you're asking them to sit in a room for many hours. Um, the meeting locations were uh, comfortable and accessible locations and uh, people were in invited in different ways. There was some uh, effort that Franklin Associates put in. A GPI helped to say, here's the folks that we wanted these meetings. Franklin Associates helped to make sure that those folks were represented so that there was a broad group of stakeholders that were invited into meetings. At each of the meetings, uh, there was a similar format that was presented for each one. And the reason this was so important is it was then able to compare how did things go differently in each of these communities, even given the same information at each one of them. Um, for the roundtables, there was a team introduction. There was an uh, a introduction to carbon management. There was a tool demonstration and application, small group discussions on some of the weighting criteria. As we mentioned, there are social factors, there are environmental factors. One of the questions the GPI and SWCA team wanted to know is, which ones are more important? If you are really going to cite something, is race and ethnicity important? Is, is historical legacy important? Are environmental factors important. What is most important to you as a community so that we can build this into the tool to make it more applicable? And then finally, there were some whole group discussions as in absolutely everybody in the room could talk about the tool, what they liked, what they would change, and how this impacted carbon management. I'm going to briefly go over some of the highlights, some of the things that were different about each one of these communities before talking about some of the ways that these were similar in each one of the communities. Um, some of the things are, are qualitative and they're the overall, all of the roundtables were great. One of the things that is interesting for those who have done community engagement is how each community can be so different. So even if you present the same information, the communities themselves can be different. In Baton Rouge, which is one of the homes of Franklin Associates, the facilitators for this meetings, um, there were uh, stronger network ties than there were in some of the other communities. Um, the round tables were a fantastic way to build relationships. So even within the meeting rooms, and this happened in some locations more than others, some of the people knew one another. It wasn't like everybody worked at the same place. It isn't that. But as you can imagine, in smaller towns, some people see familiar places, faces and feel more open to having discussions because they recognize some familiar people in the room. Um, so this was a great way for people to build relationships in and around carbon management. Um, one of the things that was interesting about Baton Rouge is this was a very 
um, this was an experienced group. So in Louisiana, in many places, there are people that have been involved in uh, petrochemical industries. And so these are not folks that have no experience. They have experience with emissions. They have experience with pollution. They have experience with pipelines. Um, and many of the people in Baton Rouge, because of the location of where this is, have lots of experience in this area. So one of the things that uh, the, the team was able to do was align the information they presented to some of the experience levels in Baton Rouge, which meant that everybody could um, participate equally. So some people had lots of experience, some people didn't have so much as we were able to uh, present the information together, everybody could participate more because of sort of building up the knowledge of folks who were there. The other thing that I would say is that facilitators and technical experts are really helpful for two-way dialogue. I cannot tell you enough about how great Matt is as a technical expert. Um, that does not mean that he's not a great facilitator, but it means that when you have a room full of people that, that folks are not necessarily familiar with, having one person that can be the subject matter expert and answer any question that somebody can ask or be very forthright and say, do you know, I just don't know the answer to this, I will get back to you. Having somebody with that level of expertise about the project, which as you have seen from Matt's um, a broad experience in carbon management, means that any questions, technical questions come up, he can usually answer. Answer. On the other hand, having facilitators who know the local communities um, is also extremely important. So this combination of facilitators who could balance voices in the room with having the technical experts really helped with the foster a two-way dialogue in Baton Rouge. In North Kenner, there was a little different uh, balance of information. Um, one of the things that was important in North Kenner was grounding information in the local context. This is going to be true in many of the communities that we went to. Um, People have not necessarily had a lot of experience in asking what they think before a project comes. So when you go and say we're interested about carbon management, people know in Louisiana that carbon management is coming in one way or the other. But being frank about what is likely to happen or not happen in a region is really helpful. So in North Kenner, having some information about here's here's where something, here's the project information we know about or we don't know about. We are associated with the project or not is really helpful. In addition, providing common information, which is going to be a, a thread across all of these, can really help facilitate discussion members, discussion for all community members. So as I have mentioned before, and again, this will come up again and again, there are some folks who could basically be the subject matter experts. There are other folks who this may be very new to them, or they're going to ground many of their experiences in comparable things. How is this like citing wind? Or how is this like pipeline? Lines, uh, oil and gas pipelines. And so having some information to begin with, which Matt and GPI helped present, helped everybody get at the same level and then be able to, or at a comparable level so that they could have more um, useful conversations about some of the questions that may happen with carbon management. The other thing that will happen, and this has happened in a couple of different communities, is that prior negative experiences can really color current outreach. When you go into a community, whether it is a carbon management experience or another siting experience, some of the issues that have happened, broken promises, bad experiences, environmental difficulties, are things that you inherit. And in North Kenner, one of the things that had come up was um, some of the conversations in facilitated conversations that had happened earlier did not leave a good impression. In fact, there were some about carbon management not related to this project at all that ha were poorly timed and didn't go well. And so some of this discussion had to kind of make up for some of the past difficulties with uh, other discussions about carbon management. Two other communities that we went to that were uh, that were more remote were Alexandria. Um, in Alexandria, different backgrounds experience is impacted individuals' contributions, which can impact the whole group's concert con conversations. And in this case, specifically, one of the things that was interesting is there were some folks that were extreme, uh, had, knew a lot of information, and some people who knew almost nothing. And in this case, 
bridging that gulf of information was a little trickier. Um, and it was a little harder to have everybody kind of have the same level of conversation because some people wanted to go so deep and some people was a new uh, information to this. On the other hand, having a tool that was interactive really helped people understand the same, access the same information at the same time. Another interesting part with Alexandria that came up as a part to uh, other places was some people came feeling like they needed to represent their job and some people came up feeling as only they needed to represent their person. And having the understanding there was it was a safe space, nobody was going to necessarily say anything outside of the room, but having a clear guidance for some folks of this is who you should represent as you're asking your questions um, could have been helpful in some of those conversations. Um, another thing that happened, this was a small thing, but in many of these uh, conversations, one of the things that we had were uh, digital um, information. Everybody had access to laptops, uh, GPI, SWCA, Franklin Associates had information for those. But in some cases, there were people that needed to, uh, information that needed to be solicited by phone. This was not a big deal because people could make it work. But in a couple of places, people had difficulty accessing this. And um, some of the caretakers in the room tried to help some of the other people in the room. And it was just an interesting dynamic. So from the perspective, of somebody who would be leading facilitating, having a very quick plan B for any of the real-time data collection when you're showing things on the screen could just help make things go a little smoother. In Sulfur, um, there were a uh, uh, is sulfur was interesting because there were a lot of people there to begin with, and then more people left. Um, there was uh, help. There was childcare that was offered for some working for some moms. Um, they still ended up leaving earlier. There were some industrial folks who were there who ended up leaving earlier, and they were industrial folks because they themselves talked about the kind of information and the background that they had as they were talking in the first part of the meeting. In this case, and I'm not sure why, because I didn't necessarily have an. Exit survey. Um, in all of the other three meetings, everybody kind of stayed and contributed through the entire time. In Sulphur, for whatever reason, there was not the same amount of interest. Um, the good part about the roundtable is there were many places throughout the afternoon where you could get information. So if somebody left, it wasn't lost. There were still data points along the way. But um, Carefully considering how long people need to stay is uh, something to consider as you're talking about collecting information from these. Some of the other interesting things about Sulphur was they had had some previous um, industrial partners that had come in. And one of the things that people writing community benefits plans have probably responded to are things like make sure that you have a diverse vendor network and make sure that you do lots of educational outreach. In the folks that were staying in Sulphur with a smaller group, there were very rich conversations about why some of those things didn't work. Um, in some cases, they felt like community outreach for some of these very technical um, uh, carbon management issues were too technical for the level, the education level of folks that were still in town. So being very careful about what words you were using and how they were presented to people in um, Sulphur were extremely important, given that some of the people in the room were trying to do outreach to, to similar groups of people. Another thing in terms of vendor networks is there were um, folks in the room that had been told in previous projects, we're going to hire uh, minority owned businesses. We're going to make sure that we have local hiring targets. But in many cases, while those were promised when the um, local communities were inviting these places in, nobody checked up to make sure that they were actually being fulfilled. So when people, this was not something that anybody was promising at this meeting, but one of the things that they were saying is, you know, what has happened in the past, one of the things that they said is it's great to say that there's going to be jobs. It's great to say that there's going to be um, business help for to get to get uh, minority owned businesses, for example, off the ground. But without a bigger infrastructure to invest in getting people from where they are now to being able to be a government contractor or being able to be hired, given, given the engineering degrees or something that needs to be happen, that was a barrier to realizing the benefits that uh, industrial partners talked about when they were first coming.
The other thing that, as I was mentioning with all of these, understanding how engagement needs to be changed to be more inclusive was especially true of the people in the room as they were reflecting on their own efforts to engage uh, local people. So they felt compared to other communities, or at least compared to what other communities were reporting, there needed to be a wider variation in the actual materials and ways that community members were out were given um, opportunities to engage with those that may be having um, community engagement meetings. When we think about all of these things, there were some things that came across for all of these. Uh, many of these things are best practices and they this is not necessarily new or novel, but across all of these meetings, these were some of the things that if we were doing pro tips for successful roundtables. Um, one of them is employed skilled facilitators. Uh, the, cab the other side of this is having great subject matter experts who can talk to a wide range of people. In both of these cases, the facilitator is a subject matter expert and the facilitator is the people who could um, make everyone in the room feel comfortable, but keeping moving forward were absolutely critical. Franklin Associates played a very important job in this and really helped bring, um, bring things together. Uh, another one is compensate attendees appropriately. Some people, their compensation is being in the room. For other people, the compensation could be food or, or gift cards or other information. It's going to depend on every community, but having some means of giving people um, something for their time is important. One thing that came up in, especially in um, Alexandria and uh, Sulphur, was articulating engagement objectives. GPI had said, uh, an SWCA, we want your, your in what you think about these tools. We want to use these to change these tools so that we can make siting better. But because of some of the actors who had been there previously, people thought, are you really citing something here? Are you really going to put something here? How is this going to be used? And although everybody was very transparent, there was more time in some of those communities to just say, really, we're just looking for background information here. We just want this before we even get started. Um, and so having a articulated engagement objective we just want your input or we're going to build something in five years was especially important for getting people to feel free to uh, speak. Providing background information so that everybody can participate was uh, extremely important. Ensuring multiple feedback pathways. So in this case, sometimes people wanted to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Sometimes people wanted to write their comments or text their comments. Sometimes people wanted to have a way to look at this tool later and, and provide feedback. And so having multiple avenues as opposed to the only way that you can tell us about this right he is right here and right now is extremely important. Along these are to keep engaging after the meeting. So as soon as you left this meeting, you could say, here's how you'll have updates, here's how you're going to keep engaged, so that there was a strategy after people left. If they wanted to have more information or share this with their friends, there was an easy pathway for doing this. Um, another goal is to strive for representative attendance, and this is hard. I think for these roundtables, it was uh, lots of great people attended. I think that if this were to be something that were to be replicated again, the the round tables is one means if it is possible that somebody else may need to be reached by a survey and other people may need to be reached by drop in sessions. Um, and so having a strategy for hearing all the voices that you need to, depending on what you need, is going to be important in order to find a way to find the people who you need to comment on these tools. And finally, it's matching facilitation to audience. In some places, coming in with a suit may be welcoming. In other places, having it more informal may be more welcoming. So having uh, facilitators who are able to make people comfortable and match the amount of information to the folks at hand is, is critical. A couple of other things to, to keep in mind is context is extremely important. Um, when you're going into communities, it behooves everyone. I, I'm sure this is ridiculous to say, but do your homework. What has happened in the area? What environmental disasters have happened in the area? What industrial things haven't gone well? What is going right? Many people have many meetings that happen very regularly with things online. And rather than going straight into a community and saying, tell me about your experiences, doing some of your homework so that you have some idea of how ready a community is for what kind of engagement, surveys versus um, roundtables versus something else is really important. In this case, Franklin Associates 
associates help, help facilitate that. Timing is important. So in some cases, some of these communities said like, look, if this is five years from now, I don't want to hear about jobs. Um, if it's five years from now, however, I may be worried about whether it's going to be close to a school or not. So figuring out the pace and the timing of when people will see things, when you need people to have input, and when people um, are not going to be so tired of constant engagement is extremely important in deciding when and where to uh, to engage with communities. This is especially true with the maturity of the technology. Um, there were many projects right now that are being launched in various phases, and some people knew a pilot project, and some people knew they were farther along. Some people had only heard the name and had no idea how far along it was. So having an idea of an engagement strategy that strategy that matches the technology is important. And finally, I think I would say, allow engagement to evolve. You know, we had uh, four uh, stakeholder um, roundtables, which were great. And as we reflect on these, the next time that we do something like this, it may look different. Um, and that's okay. You get information. There's kind of a continuous improvement. Think about what are multiple technologies? Are there multiple projects in the area? Um, have people already been engaged in four different ways? And this is going to be another means of engagement. So finding a, a way that matches what you're looking for to what kind of engagement you need. For this particular project, roundtables were perfect. It was a small enough group that everybody could talk together. People could process with team members of how it was going. Um, having this tool at this stage in time before many of these projects were going was a, a great match. This may or may not be a great match depending on um, what other objectives you would have. And I'm just going to end here um, as we're finished with this, the this the slides for this and the report and the webinar will all be accessed um, through a website. We'll be able to tell you this on Carbon Solutions. Um, I, I think the some of the concluding thoughts here are carbon management is going to require lots of different strategies. Roundtables in this case, again, were absolutely great. And I think one of the other things that I would say for this is the decision support tool as a way that people could access the same information at the same time and talk about it together was a really effective way of um, soliciting information about carbon management. Um, I will conclude here. We have some time for questions. I will stop sharing my screen, but I appreciate everybody's attention. I think there's a range of questions in the chat and some people putting their hands up, so maybe we can run through those. Uh, I can quickly start going through the questions that are in the, uh, the q and I think there might be some things in the chat too. Uh, the top, the first question we had was one company storing CO2 from the um, RNG process where CO2 is a byproduct of anaerobic digesters and landfills applied their own geology, specialists provide CO2 storage design and always providing the design of RNG process. Is this typical of CO2 storage designs in the RNG market? I don't know if you want to take that out or not, if Matt has any comments. I'm going to ask Matt, but I'm not really sure about the um, RNG market process. And I'm going to have to agree with Aaron and Richard. I'm not exactly sure what the uh, the. I mean, I, I assume we're talking renewable natural gas, but I, uh, um, I'm I'm not exactly sure of the answer to this question. And I'll take the blame for that for not reading the question before uh, um, I went through. 
So I'm um, actually looking at some of these. So I'm going to take some of these or pass some of them to Matt as I was looking at these. One of them is says, did roundtable participants participants have any thoughts on whether or not historic polluters like oil and gas companies should be involved in carbon management? Um, I'm going to start with this and then I'm happy for Matt to have feelings about this too. I, I think one of the things that is interesting as we've worked in places where there has been a legacy in oil of, and gas is that there are generations of folks that have worked for oil and gas companies. And it is true that there are some people who absolutely hate oil and gas, but it's also true that there are oil and gas companies that are helping to keep communities there and alive. And so from my perspective, I would say never go into a community saying this is how you should feel about oil and gas. Have community members talk about their experiences and whether it works or not. There are some specific companies that people are much more concerned about than others. And there are some environmental groups that are sometimes seen as outsiders in communities that can be much more concerned than community members themselves can be about oil and gas. Um, and so my short answer is that it's complicated, but I'm happy for Matt to um, to weigh in in any way. No, I agree. It's complicated. The one thing that I'd add to it is, as we build out these projects, the the oil and gas industry has the technical expertise. They've been drilling wells, injecting CO2, uh, and, and storing as well as extracting for decades into a century. So uh, they 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 may not have the best perception among communities, but we have to understand that the technical competence will be with the oil and gas industry until these markets evolve and others become more up to speed on development. Thanks. Um, one of the other questions that I'm going to answer is, um, I'm curious to hear more about the structure of the round tables. Did you present folks with information first or dive straight into the discussion? Did you compensate? Were um, just community members not attending in an official account, uh, capacity? How long were the round tables? So the round tables, I'll start a little bit. They were, they were three to four hours long. There was some extra time that people could come if they wanted to eat, and some people were invited to stay longer if discussions wanted to go longer. Um, the folks were compensated for their time in order to be there, although I, I'm sure there were some people who went because of the compensation and some people who went regardless. Um, there was information that was presented to people before they actually started. Um, there was some um, Carbon Management 101 that um, GPI had created so that there was some information. There was no, from my evaluative perspective, there was no sort of test to say like how much did people know before they came in. So it was kind of at will of anybody if they wanted to read this or not as it was coming in. But there was some information presented beforehand. There was multiple ways for people to see information information as it was there. Uh, people presented, they could see on the website, they could have, there were papers on the um, tables. And then um, nobody was attending in necessarily an official capacity. It wasn't like somebody said, and this is the Chamber of Commerce that's here. There was a, a mix of people from different experiences and backgrounds at each one of them. Matt, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add. No, I think you did a great job. Everybody in the room was considered an equal. There was no one that was hierarchically uh, more uh, of value, uh, more of interest or important than anyone else. And everybody's uh, feedback was equally considered. There's one along these, and I'm going to have you jump in with this one too, Matt, that's I'm curious whether or not you invited um, any environmental justice organizations or advocates at these roundtables. From my perspective, I did not, I had the benefit of not being responsible for inviting people, but being able to see how people interacted. And there were people who said, I'm against this from the beginning, or I am for this from the beginning, or um, there were students that were there, there were environmental groups that were there. And so I, Matt can talk a little bit more about about um, how the balance was, but uh, there were everyone, everyone's perspectives uh, that people were free to, to say at the meeting. Yeah, you know, our objective was not to have everybody there that was cheering for the deployment of carbon management because we all understand that's not the reality of the space that we're in. So there was actually a two phased approach. There were initial outreach surveys to specific entities to get feedback on who may be best uh, to invite to the round tables and what some of the greater concerns were. But as far as getting people in the room, the, the intent was to have small room sizes, uh, a small number of people in the room so we could actually have 
have active dialogue and be very diverse in those. So we were not shying away from people who were not supportive of carbon management and those that had very, very strong concerns of environmental justice issues. Um, one of the early comments that we may have answered, but I'm still going to answer now, and I'm curious for your perspective, Matt, so I'm doing this to like slightly answer it and then pass it back to you, but it says, I believe Louisiana has had more classics well permits um, approved. There is, I was trying to update this every week or two with the numbers because there were so many applications that um, anything that I did became outdated very quickly. Um, I mentioned Wyoming and um, North Dakota have different ones, but another place where there are lots of classics well permits are California. And I guess I'm curious from your perspective, Matt, um, if you could talk a little bit about why there's so many classics well permits in one place versus another. Yeah, I think the, the simple answer for Wyoming and North Dakota is that we have primacy and we uh, review and approve those classics well applications in state. And I say we because I live in Wyoming. I've been here for 20 years. Um, primacy is uh, very, very well supported by many people just because you have in state expertise as well as resources to move through those applications while uh, maintaining the rigor of federal requirements at, at a faster pace. At this point, I think EPA, the last I saw, they have 169 uh, Class 6 well applications. To date, they've approved two. Uh, so those are in Illinois. So uh, that's 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 a large push as to why uh, projects are being uh, proposed in, in various locations. Um, Louisiana, we would anticipate they'll receive primacy hopefully by the end of the year, but yet to be determined, but they're they're well on their way. And then I think the 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 realities are we have a lot of political interest in, in pursuit of projects in various states. And then just the resource applicability, as Aaron mentioned, uh, emission sources. Louisiana has a huge amount of emission sources as well as geology. So pairing those two uh, outputs and inputs is pretty important to develop projects. Thanks. I think we have time for about one more question. One of the questions that we had is there policy or guidance on the best management practices for operators to follow for CCUS projects, checklists, document requ required schedules to follow. I can answer some of this from a community benefits perspective, which is best practices are evolving. Um, American Petroleum Institute, um, some pipeline outfits, some people are building this right now. And the, the legacy is difficult because do you want to trust people that may have made mistakes in the past? On the other hand, sometimes they have learned more from the past that they don't want to repeat now. Um, and so I would say this is evolving. But um, Matt, I'm, I'm curious if you have uh, checklist documents, anything like that, that you have as kind of documents that um, that GPI may have put together. Yeah, as you mentioned, these are being developed as we speak. It's a double-edged sword, to be honest with you, because the community challenges in Louisiana are much different than the community challenges in a North Dakota or California. So if we develop some sort of baseline, uh, what's what's potentially good, but everything's going to have to be catered to the specific location just because resources and people are so different uh, across the country. So have to be very careful with one size fits all sorts of community engagement plans. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think some of the things we're seeing is, could there at least be consistency on some of the best engineering practices so that all communities can have access to the best monitoring plans, to the best technology available, to the best communication about those things? Some of those could be consistent across states, but many of the actual decisions are sort of going to be, as you were saying, um, more embedded in the, the needs and desires of, of communities. Um, we are just about at time. I realize that I did not get to everybody's questions, but I really appreciate your time, Matt. I appreciate your time as well. Um, we'll have other information for this report um, and link to the decision support tool um, forthcoming for anybody who has um, attended. But otherwise, I would like to thank everybody for their time and um, hope that you have a good afternoon.